All right. Well, I think we are officially live on YouTube now. We've uh, we're checking out who the super keeners are. Who's awake at this hour? Who's who's tuning in to YouTube at 8 a.m. Mountain Time? If you're on the East Coast, it's not it's not too early, but we uh, we figured we'd try this this time out, guys, and um, do a little intro to permaculture live stream with Mark. So we are really excited to have him here um, with us this morning. Um, Mark is actually uh, going to be teaching in our PDC this fall. So we are bringing him in to do a little mini intro and agroforestry basics, if that is a topic that is of interest to you. And um, Mark is also the author of a new book called Coppice Agroforestry. So um, I'm going to be hopping in to the uh, YouTube chat in a minute here. So I'll, I'll guide you guys on where you can check that book out. And um, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to Mark um, to to jump in here. These are these little casual lives we're doing, guys. So we will have the opportunity to do some questions at the end. Um, Mark will chat for about thirty minutes, and um, we'll answer any questions that you guys have. So, alrighty, Mark, take it away. Sounds great. Excellent. Sounds great, Jen. Thanks so much, and thanks for to Mitch for helping on the. Uh, the uh, IT side of things here. Um, it's great to be with you guys. I'm going to just launch right into some screen share stuff here. And um, yeah, I, I'm i really happy to once again be part of the Verge team for this upcoming PDC. Uh, they do such a great job getting word out in a very professional and thorough way. And I've built a great team that I'm, I'm proud to be a part of. So um, thank you guys for making this happen. Um, tiny bit of background about myself. So I live in Vermont in the, in the States and my wife and I have a small farm. We primarily grow shiitake mushrooms and a few different kinds of berries, especially black currants. Um, the name of our farm is Valley Clay Plain Forest Farm. We're on about 52 acres, but um, a lot of our agroforestry enterprise is on you know, about 11 acres or so. Um, not all of which is planted out necessarily. Um, I also do consulting and design, and um, I've been a permaculture educator for the last 15 or so years. And so this is something that's part of my, you know, daily life. My, I'm constantly eat, eating, sleeping, drinking, and thinking this stuff. And um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. And this is kind of a bit of a trailer that will just kind of lead you in to some of the themes I'll be discussing during my uh, presentation in Verge's PDC. And so we're going to be looking a little bit at the fundamentals of agroforestry and just a little bit of info on key line patterning. And so when we talk about agroforestry, we're talking about, you know, working trees as part of working landscapes. And I always like to start things off with some definitions. Um, one that, well, I think most simply we could say it's the integration of tree and shrub crops with other types of agriculture. That's essentially what agroforestry is. Um, it's just this kind of the radical notion that trees and shrubs have a place in farming um, and can actually benefit mutually from integration with animals and or other types of row crops. And I think it's also worth just talking about some of the other the synonymous forms of agriculture, because we often find that there are similar terms used to describe the same vision or goal. So one that I think is, is helpful in some contexts is just woody agriculture, looking at you know, trees and shrubs as valuable elements in farm enterprise. Um, I also really value Mark Shepard's framing of restoration agriculture. So I'm, I'm on the conservation commission in my town, and I feel like that's a really good uh, gateway introduction for folks that are more conservation minded to some of the benefits and promise of agroforestry is in the the habitat it benefits the um, ecosystem services that come with you know tree crop integration. Um, if we're thinking of things within this lens of permaculture, I know for myself during my early years as 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 a, a learner, um, I found that often. Zone three in that zones of use continuum was something that was often very nebulous. Um, zone four, I think I, I was able to make some sense of, but zone three, I never necessarily got. And I feel like one of the places 
where agroforestry really fits into that permaculture zones of use framework is it's, it's kind of our zone three and, and in some cases zone four type activities where we're either you know, tending or managing or interacting with wild populations of, of plants and animals um, in existing forested land, or it's more of kind of the farm scale expression of permaculture as what I see is often being more of a zone three type land use practice. And I probably should have started off with this from the get go, but you know, agroforestry is nothing new. It's basically the way that indigenous people the world over have interacted with, tended, and managed landscapes for the you know entirety of human history. And so, in a lot of cases, we're just kind of reinventing some of these practices for our modern context with different tools, technologies, economies, and needs. But fundamentally, um, you know, we're really just learning from the ways people have interacted with landscape. Um, recognizing that trees and shrubs are vital parts of um, holistic and diverse and ecological land use practices. And I think especially if we're looking to build bridges along with more conventionally minded growers, um, be it um, extension agents or university professors or um, you know PhD type folks, along with um, just more conventional farmers, Agroforestry is a really fantastic um, kind of inroad into the language and the more practical framing that we really need to look at when we think of how permaculture might inform a more uh, reasoned, thorough, holistic, and diverse farm um, vision and practice. So let's see here. So just some fundamentals again, and I'm gonna go into more detail when we get into this in the class, but um, when we think about you know, the com constituents or the component parts of agroforestry, it's kind of simple, although it can get quite complex, but we have a nice quote here um, from Michelle Schoenberger, agroforestry represents a fluid continuum among trees, crops, and livestock, ranging from a few trees established within a field or pasture to multi-story forests managed for a variety of products. And so I think that idea of a continuum that it's not necessarily these kind of fixed system point in time expressions, right? It could be literally tending the forest and doing you know, wild crafting in the understory or doing timber stand improvement thinning to harvest wood products for craft materials or fuel wood or for mushroom production. Um, and then at the other end of the continuum, it could be literally like rows of trees with some type of herbaceous forage managed in between those rows. But the main constituents are gonna be trees, livestock, and more often like herbaceous crops. And so again, this kind of graphic on the right-hand side here, um, the idea of this being sort of this continuum um, in which some or all three of these elements may be represented as a good one. When we start to talk about, you know, more conventional agroforestry theory and practice, what we often see is um, and actually I see six here, um, six main practices that are recognized and described when you get more into the kind of academia um, theory and practice around agroforestry or just really the more nuts and bolts practices that we tend to see and in, in, um, in, you know, recognized by like the United States Department of Agriculture. And I'm less familiar with some of the uh, Canadian institutions, but I imagine there's probably a lot of overlap. So, um, when we talk about these main practices, these are the ones here, alley cropping, which generally describes rows or belts of trees or shrubs with other things happening in the alleys between. Generally, that's going to be livestock grazing, or it's going to be some type of row cropping. So we could be growing um, a grain, we could be growing corn or soybeans, um, it could be winter squash or garlic. Um, this can be done again at various scales, so we can really shrink it down to be more homestead scale, and then this could be expanded to you know covering hundreds or thousands of acres as well. Um, silvopasture, the words uh, contraction of silva meaning you know Latin for wood, um, directly related to silva culture, the growing and cultivation of trees, along with pasture grazing, and so it's the idea of bringing animals into some type of forest cover and it's looking at the benefits that emerge when we do that. 
and it doesn't necessarily have to be forest cover either. It could be within, you know, an orchard system. Um, and that orchard system could be in rows or that silvopasture may be more of a savanna type ecosystem. Windbreaks and shelter belts, which are often used to create some protection from um, wind or provide visual screening um, or maybe perhaps some filtration from odors. Um, just another expression of agroforestry. These may be focused more around just the ecological functions they provide and less on actual like crop production, although obviously those things could be married together and they could be providing multiple benefits. Um, riparian buffers, riparian buffer strips, the term riparian describes areas adjacent to water. And in many cases, these have been some of the most um, uh, frequently cleared and um, more vulnerable ecological um, components of our landscapes because often more large scale agriculture tends to occur in our valley bottoms. And we often see that agriculture extending like right up to the edge of our waterways with land cleared all the way to the edge. And in many ecosystems, these areas are naturally um, you know, blanketed with a diverse buffer of trees and shrubs that help filter nutrients, prevent erosion, stabilize the banks, create valuable corridors for wildlife, shelter and shade the water and keep it cool. And so we see a lot of good restoration work that's going into reestablishing riparian buffers and agroforestry just becomes another mechanism to help inform and incentivize uh, the development of riparian buffers. Next uh, would be hedgerows, belts, rows of trees and shrubs that partition spaces often between fields. And these could be living fences. They also could just be windbreaks. Um, we see that there's some overlap as we start to get into some of these systems because your hedgerows could also be part of an alley cropping silvopasture system that also provides shelter um, or you know windbreaks. And then last in this in this uh, kind of set of systems be forest farming. The idea that we are actually using the conditions in a natural forest as the kind of uh, guiding and organizing characteristics around a farm enterprise. And so in most cases, this means we're gonna be looking at crops that can handle a bunch of shade. And so things like ginseng and golden seal and black cohosh um, along with mushrooms, uh, both wildcrafted and cultivated are some of the more common elements of forest farming. And um, so, yeah, essentially, oh, I should have, I forgot that I had this little build out here. So um, we got some examples, in this case, alley cropping, uh, an alley cropping silvopasture system with cows grazing between rows of, um, I'm going to say these are slash pines down in the southeastern United States, um, growing for timber. Here's a silvopasture that's a little more savanna-esque it appears in its patterning. So less linear, more clumpy, patchy. Um, we've got shelter belts protecting a uh, farm complex and a house here in the, in the plain states. Um, over here, we're looking at a riparian buffer that looks, you know, pretty, pretty filled out along this waterway. It does get a little thin in a few spots, but certainly better than what we often see in agricultural landscapes. Um, hedgerows, partitioning fields there in the UK. And um, and then we've got some understory wildcrafting going on here with some um, shade tolerant medicinal herbs in the understory of a forest. So one thing we'll get into in a lot more detail in my lecture during the class is um, actually starting to drill down and look at what it is that makes each of these systems a system. Right, because alley cropping itself isn't really a system, it's more of a practice, it's an expression of agroforestry and the landscape. But what are all the pieces that together make up an alley cropping or agroforestry system? And so this is just my um, suggestion as far as a way of kind of organizing these different elements along this um, more structured, um, uh, what do we call it? framework, I suppose. So one thing that makes the system a system would be the land use pattern. And that's really gets back to the constituents that I showed in that earlier slide with the, the triangle graphic um, that we either have livestock, crops, um, a forested canopy, or just some type of trees and shrubs. And so what are those elements that are all a part of that system and how is it broadly expressed? 
Um, the species are obviously a key part of the system. So that could be tree crops or berries. That could be the livestock and or the annual or herbaceous perennials. Um, the products and economics are a huge driver of agroforestry because when we talk about farm scale permaculture, agroforestry, it really needs to be viable economically. It needs to kind of carry its own weight um, to help incentivize the both installation and then long-term management of the system. And so that's that's a key foundation is the, the financial side of things. Um, the architecture, right? How many layers are we talking about? And as we get into ideas like um, forest gardening or food forests, you know, we see that expressed um, to sort of its highest potential. And I really should have included forest gardening along that um, that list of six agroforestry practices, because in my mind, that's kind of the home scale expression of agroforestry. Um, in some cases, you'll see it described as like multi strata agroforestry. But um, we think about how many layers, how many different crops can we stack into the same space and make optimal use of water, sunlight and minerals and space. Um, and then another element to these, this framework would be the, the time expression of it. What are the intervals between harvest and production? Um, and that's going to be a big challenge that we need to address as we think about design. If we're looking at systems that are, um, you know, financially viable is if we're looking at, you know, nut trees or fruit trees, there's going to be five to 10 years before we're really seeing much of a return on that investment. So are there opportunities in the interim to kind of capitalize on that extra space um, and, and generate some income in the short term? Because for people whose livelihoods really revolve around farm production, um, you know, they can't necessarily afford to uh, forego those short-term returns for the long-term promise of agroforestry. And then last would be the way that the system is expressed in the landscape. So what's the pattern and what's the spacing? Um, and when it comes to spacing, we're especially if we're talking about rows, we're talking about the spacing within the row, how many feet or meters apart are the plants within a row and how far apart are the rows themselves? So that's the within row and between row elements of spacing. Um, and then similarly, um, we can think about the different patterns that that system may express. And this could be like patches or clumps in the more irregular type savanna uh, expression like we I showed in a few slides back. But also it might just be in straight rows, which is going to be a lot more practical for any type of cropping system, um, that especially one that's mechanized. And so that row, those rows could follow a grid pattern. They could be on contour. They could follow key line. And I'm not even going to begin to try to describe key line to you all right now because it's kind of its own topic altogether. But I did just want to address it briefly because, um, again, this is a little bit of a teaser as to what I'm going to be covering once we get into the class proper. And um, key line as a practice is something that was developed by P.A. Yeomans, a farmer and mining engineer from Australia, who was really looking to restore vitality and resilience to uh, a much abused Australian farm landscape in the 1940s and 50s, 60s. There were a number of books on his concept of key line design, which is a holistic approach to land planning. And it's focused really around um, the acknowledgement of the fact that the topography is one of the most fixed aspects of our landscapes. And so our farm design, our infrastructure, plantings, access, all ought to revolve around our appreciation and knowledge of the topography. And so the geography of the landscape is something that's really crucial to us understanding that. And I just have a few aerial images that give you an idea of what a key line farm layout might look like um, and some different climate types in different parts of the world. So here we are at Wolf Gulch Farm in Jacksonville, Oregon. We can see you know, uh, water catchment placed in the landscape and these contour-esque, but not quite true contour layouts of the rows that are you know, capturing and storing um, or helping infiltrate any water as much as possible. But what Keyline looks to do is actually try to disperse that water across the landscape as evenly as possible as well. Um, so Darren Doherty is, is a teacher of mine. He's um, based in Australia, but has traveled all over the world for the past uh, I should have said the last uh, farm, I believe, was designed by um, Tommy Hazel in, um, in Oregon. Um, in this case, this is a project 
designed and, and installed by Darren Doherty in Australia. And here we can make out what that patterning looks like in a valley shaped um, farm landscape. In this case, we've also got the access roads connected as catchment feeding high water storage ponds that can be used for gravity irrigation. Um, folks may be familiar with the work of Mark Shepard at New Forest Farm in southwestern Wisconsin, where we have um, an alley cropping system that integrated grazing animals along with row crops um, to a apple, hazelnut, and chestnut, and others, but I believe those are the primary crops, um, agroforestry type system. And so here you're seeing the layout of the trees and how that ultimately responds to the topography. There's a, a valley here and a broad ridge here. And so the pattern really looks to follow that as opposed to just like straight rows that follow a fence line, which is what we often tend to see in more conventional farm approaches. Um, a very dynamic landscape designed and installed by Grant Schultz in Iowa City, Iowa um, at his farm that I believe is no longer active, but VersaLand. Um, and in this case, we're looking at the so I believe these are either one or two foot contour lines in black um, overlaid on top of the ultimate layout of the trees. And so again, the goal vision there is optimization of water, minimization of erosion um, in the layout and patterning of the land. Here's another one of Darren Doherty's designs. Again, we're gonna get into all of this in much more detail in the class, but just a little taste of what one type of patterning can look like in an agroforestry system. So with the last 10 or so minutes, I'm just gonna give you a real quick uh, little overview of some of the promising species and um, some examples of case studies, like how does the stuff look in the landscape? And we're gonna get into these in more detail during the class. Um, I'm not gonna read all this off right now, but you know, when we think about the architecture of an agroforestry system, we often tend to start with the canopy, both because it's the longest term return on our investment, um, and it's often kind of the anchor of the system. And so in that case, we're looking at things like nuts and fruits and timber and fuel wood um, as the main products or economic um, outputs of our canopy. Obviously not listed here would be all of the ecosystem benefits as well. Um, for people that are grazing animals, shade and protection from wind um, and cold is key among them, I would say, too. So that is sort of missing here, um, along with erosion prevention and water infiltration, and carbon sequestration and soil improvement and formation. Um, and then, you know, as we move down one layer, often when we're talking agroforestry, it's, you know, trees and shrubs are the main woody elements of our production. And so there's a lot of options for small fruits, um, especially for cold climate folks like myself and uh, you know, the folks, uh, part of the Verge team, uh, we're often thinking about what types of things yield really well, um, especially pretty quickly, given how short our growing season is. Um, and so I'm a big fan of a lot of the different types of small fruits, especially as a way to, you know, during the early years of system installation, kind of help monetize um, the, uh, the, the in implementation over time. And then what's also missing here. Um, I don't have any detail on it, but obviously it would be whatever livestock elements you have, and that would include species. So cows, sheep, goats, pigs, poultry, um, along with the breeds, because certain breeds may be better suited to different types of conditions. And then also, you know, again, this could be part of uh, a more annual or herbaceous perennial row crop system. You could be growing cut flowers, you could be growing grains, you could be growing corn. Um, technically, I guess it would be a grain as well, but um, this could be integrated, uh, you know, integrated into more annual cropping systems, knowing that over time, as these canopies begin to converge, um, the available light for annual crops is going to start to diminish. And so there'll be this transition in harvest over time. So real quick, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taste of some of the different ways people have creatively developed systems that are built around the realities, both the resources and constraints of the places where they lived, like indigenous Californians. A book that I found to be super informative and inspiring is Tending the Wild by MCAT Anderson. Um, just looking at the, the different practices indigenous Californians used to modify, enhance, diversify um, the landscape and support themselves 
in a um, horticultural fashion, despite the fact that they would tend to move throughout the larger landscape seasonally um, in order to access resources that were available at different points in the year. And so we can see some really brilliant, visionary, inspiring ways of um, you know, diverse and mutually beneficial interaction between people and landscape expressed in the practices of indigenous Californians. Um, one of the more well-known expressions of agroforestry is known as Dehesa in Spain and Montado in Portugal. And uh, I believe this covers about two thirds of the Iberian Peninsula, which is the European region, including Spain and Portugal. And essentially this is like a managed savanna um, where we see primary canopy species being um, a couple different types of oak, Quercus suber and Quercus ilex, um, Quercus suber being the cork oak. And in that um, upper left photo, we see these gentlemen harvesting the outer bark from cork oak trees. That is the source of all cork. All cork products come from the sustainable harvest of cork, which is pretty remarkable. I believe every 10 or so years, they're able to literally strip the outer bark off of cork trees. Um, and so there's kind of this, this uh, you know, long-term, I wouldn't say it's necessarily mutually beneficial, but it's a sustainable expression of um, you know, land management and resource management expressed here. And the understory is primarily used for grazing livestock, especially pigs. And the Hamon Iberico de Bellota is one of the more famous products coming from these Dehesa landscapes with um, pork that is um, fed out during its last few months of life on fallen acorns. And the flavor and quality of that meat is unparalleled and valued accordingly with, you know, um, this, this product fetching upwards of $100 or more per pound. So um, a lot of people are already familiar with Dehesa, but it's one of these ancestral systems that continues to be practiced today. I should say, I don't have a slide in here, but in my part of the world, um, maple syrup har harvesting is one of the few um, expressions of agroforestry that kind of continues to be uh, practiced where it's a true forest farming system. We're managing forested landscapes in more of a wildcraft type tending way as opposed to you know planting um, the landscape and uh, and it's something that's still quite viable and you know practiced widely. As we looked at the tropics we see a lot of inspiration because the shorter lag between planting and harvest makes agroforestry just kind of widely appropriate also coupled with the fact that often this is more human scale um, and um, landscapes tend to be more complex with um, soils that tend to uh, be more deficient in terms of their nutrient holding capacity. Multi-story farming just makes a lot more sense because of the way nutrients cycle through tropical and subtropical ecosystems. Um, in this case, we see a brilliant system, including tobacco, chili, cinnamon, and coffee, providing both like short-term yields in the tobacco and chili, medium-term yields in the coffee, well, medium and long, because the coffee is also shade tolerant, and then a long-term yield with the cinnamon. Um, I mentioned Mark Shepard's farm earlier, but we're looking at tree and shrub crops um, in rows and alley cropping system uh, that include a wide diversity of species. You can read more about this um, in his book, Restoration Agriculture. Um, Red Fern Farm in Southeast Iowa is an agroforestry farm with a focus on um, some nursery crops, including seeds, cyan wood, nuts, and fruits. They also have a U-pick element to their farm. Um, that includes species like Cornelian cherry, aronia, hazelnut, pawpaw, persimmons, heartnut, Asian pear, and chestnut. Um, Shauna Hansen is a um, kind of a regional neighbor of mine who has the small um, goat dairy, and she is basically tending trees in her forested landscape, um, harvesting the, the the tree hay or the the leafed out stems from trees um, as really valuable feed for her animals. And so this is a very human scale, small scale approach to um, managing a goat dairy and basically working with the resources she has rather than clearing out her woods altogether um, and also finding the benefits that come from um, feeding animals types of feed that they're especially adapted to. Um, at our small farm, we grow uh, shiitake mushrooms, 
And that is kind of part and parcel with the forestry work that we do both on our farm and on near the farms or the landscapes of nearby landowners um, to selectively thin dense patches of smaller diameter trees and um, and then you know convert that wood into you know, beautiful, delicious, nutritious, uh, log-grown shiitake mushrooms. Um, a friend and uh, nearby neighbor of mine, Buzz Fervor in Berlin, Vermont, has an amazing nursery. And so we increasingly see small-scale nurseries emerging as a really viable way to both feed the increasing demand for um, tree crops and then also provide a really strong um, and compact way of generating some income while at the same time, you know, preserving, enhancing, and dispersing biological diversity to the larger community. Um, and uh, I'm going to just skip ahead here. I think I've just got a couple slides left. Um, friends and colleagues, uh, Steve Gabriel, Steve and Elizabeth Gabriel um, own Wellspring Forest Farm. Steve's the author of the uh, Silvo Pasture book and co-author of the book on forest farming uh, published by Chelsea Green. They're in central New York state um, and they are also integrating livestock into, um, into hedgerows that they manage both for fodder for the animals, often of willow and black locust and red alder, coupled with a few different types of small fruit production like elderberry, especially. Um, they have a small stand of sugar maple that they manage and make uh, maple syrup. And then they've also integrated um, pastured duck, uh, a pasture duck enterprise along with uh, log grown shiitake mushrooms as well. And um, one of the uh, regional um, inspirations around some of these different elements of agroforestry is Brett Shedzoy um, at, um, at Angus Glen Farms in New York State, where he's got about 100 cows on 300 acres. And um, going back probably over 30 years ago, he planted black locust trees to create a grove both for improved conditions for the livestock but also as a way to generate really dense and rot resistant fence posts that he thins as appropriate um, with about a 10-year rotation on his fence posts um, and so just looking at the clock here and i've got i think one more slide i wanted to hit so the last thing i wanted to mention was um, an example of a riparian buffer and this is at my friend Keith Morris's place in Johnson, Vermont. He lives along the Lamoille River. And um, so one key element of his farm vision is to basically restore that um, treed protection and, um, and you know, erosion prevention along the banks of the Lamoille, which has been deforested in many cases all the way up to the edge um, with diverse yielding species like pawpaws, black locusts, wild plums, um, different types of maples, chestnuts, et cetera. Um, so he's got multi-storied installation that um, both provides ecosystem benefits, but also food and fiber to harvest. And uh, there we go. So that's just a little bit of what we're going to get into during my lecture um, in the upcoming PDC. I hope that gave you um, a broader understanding of what agroforestry is and can be. And um, you know some inspiration to think about how some of these elements might be integrated into your homes and landscapes. So I'll quit my slides here and stop the share and open it up for any questions that may have come up. Thanks, Mark. That was great. Um, so I'll just uh, prompt folks who are tuning in that you can ask Mark some questions. So we've got a couple of minutes here for, for Q&A. So if you're watching, just head over to the chat and uh, drop some questions in there if you if you have any agroforestry or key line related questions, even coppicing that we didn't you know get too much into today. But if you have any questions on, on those topics, feel free to um, type them in the chat and we'll share them with Mark. Um, I do have um, a question for you, Mark, and it's one I know that our students often struggle with um, in the permaculture design course. And mm -hmm. I know this is something that you go more into in class, so you can kind of give us the, the short winded answer. But is, yeah. is that difference and 
use between when should I use key lime, when do I use a swale? Can hmm. both grow trees or is one for a certain climate? When is my geography appropriate for both? Kind of maybe giving some examples and some context of situations of, of when you might use one or the other um, in, in yep. a specific project. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is hard to explain even when we're in the field and looking at the system that's in place for some folks um, or when we're looking at slides and like every single question that emerges, it always kind of depends on your specific context. Um, so you could absolutely have swales as part of a key line system. The swale itself, the, the actual like ditch or basin and berm could just follow a key line pattern. So um, in my mind, the kind of compare contrast would be more like contour layout versus key line patterning or contour patterning versus key line. And I think that is going to depend on your context, goals, soils, et cetera, um, with soils being a big one often and the nature of your landscape. Um, contour layouts are going to be perfectly level across the landscape. So if you have a swale, any water that would be collected in that swale is just going to be kind of captured as it runs off in place and not dispersed anywhere. Whereas if you had a swale that was pitched along key line, the goal with key line is to try to move water from where it's naturally in abundance in concave valleys where water naturally accumulates and gently draw it out down toward ridges that naturally tend to be drier. And, um, and so it's, it's slightly off contour. And the, so that's one element. And then the other big piece would just be that with key line, uh, the intention is to create a symmetrical pattern so that like, if you can remember the pictures that I showed during that brief little key line interlude, all of the rows were basically perfectly parallel to each other. And that's really valuable for more conventional farming where you need to use equipment um, with contour it's rare that you're going to have symmetry between your rows because contours are rarely symmetrical. So um, they will perform the function of capturing water where it falls, keeping it from running off, but they will not, they will give you uneven spacing between rows, which often doesn't pair very well with, um, with any type of mechanized farming. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so hopefully that was a little bit um, enlightening for folks that maybe have struggled with that difference of, of the two. Certainly, I think, you know, the moral of the story, as is with almost everything in permaculture, is that you just have to know your context, and right? And there's not a, a one size fits all for everyone. Um, there is a time and a place for all of these different techniques. Um, and they're, they're both valid and they both have uh, beautiful benefits, but they, they may not be appropriate for, for every context, for sure. One, what I tried to contextualize it with too, I did it very briefly, but it's just at the end of the day that that is the pattern expression of your design. And so you could have all these other things figured out and then you get to that last bit and it's like, okay, well, what is the spacing and what's the layout? And it could be a grid because maybe that makes sense. Maybe it's fairly flat and it just is going to fit your landscape better to have straight lines in a grid. It could be contour, it could be key line. And it's a matter of just kind of weighing the pros and cons of each and and doing some design concept planning and just like comparing and contrasting how do those look um you know the idea of like we can make mistakes on paper rather than out in the field so design being the substitution of error for chance that we we try things out before we put them in yeah i like that that's a good uh, uh definition of of how to use design <laughs> mm -hmm. um great so Something that um, comes up for me and and I know for a lot of our students as well is in a situation where maybe I had, you know, 20 acres and I wanted to implement some type of civil pasture or alley cropping. Is there any livestock it, from, from your knowledge that does not work with a system like this? Is there is there a situation where you'd say do not integrate this type of animal or can I is there is it virtually it, I think so. Them? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't. Um, I think the, so um, I w in, in our hypothetical, it, I'm, I was imagining initially that you had open in, like a field and you were thinking about planting trees. Um, in that case, no, I don't think so at all. Um, 
you design the system around whatever needs you might be trying to meet in the livestock species you're talking about. Um, agroforestry, especially silvopasture, in some cases has gotten a bit of a bad rap because um, sometimes what people will call silvopasture is literally just kind of turning their animals loose in the forest. And most people would say that's not silvopasture. Silvopasture would be targeted thinning of a forest to in, reduce the canopy enough that grass and forbs can grow in the understory. And so like, you know, people, the idea of turning pigs loose in the woods, well, they can do a, it, the management element is really crucial to that. And so it's not that the animals won't necessarily thrive, although obviously like, you know, cows or sheep in a dense forested canopy, there's just not that much in the understory for them to eat. So they're not going to find the, the nutrition that they might otherwise need. They're going to need a bigger area. Um, and then coupled with the damage that they can cause when they don't have adequate feed is that they're going to be, you know, over browsing certain things. They're going to be compacting stuff, you know, with pigs, especially some of the um, compaction that they can do um, and just damage to the understory. And so it's both a function of like management and timing. How long do the animals stay in any given paddock? But then also, how have you tried to um, adapt the canopy? It's generally going to come to the canopy. How have you tried to modify the canopy so that their needs in the understory are also met? And so I would definitely say that that is an area where people should be careful if you're trying to convert existing forests to silver pasture. Yeah, okay, perfect. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we actually, we have a, a question here in the chat from Michelle. And she is asking, is there a general rule for spacing for nut trees to start a canopy? Probably. Um, it would depend on the species. And uh, if we're talking nut trees, my head usually just like reverts back to like 25 to 30 feet as sort of the idealized canopy spread of any kind of like standard tree, if it's a fruit tree or a nut tree, you know, often 30 feet. Um, and that would be like the within the row spacing. If we're talking about something like hazelnuts, it may be more like 10, 12, 15 feet. Um, technically, it's not a tree. But I'd say, again, kind of depends. I would spend a little bit of time to look at the, the specific species, but somewhere in the 20 to 30 foot range. Um, they do talk about like black walnuts having a spread that can reach, you know, 45 feet. Um, I think that would be a little bit wide, though. I, that, again, comes back to how much space do you have and what happens in between. Um, the between row spacing can vary a lot depending on what you want to happen in between. Um, I've spaced a lot of my tree rows at 30 feet, which theoretically mean when the canopy is closed, there's very little light reaching the understory. Um, if I had more space, I might make that space, that distance a hundred feet or 200 feet or more. Um, especially if I was doing more grazing or, you know, something else that's annual based in between. Um, so the the within row spacing if you're trying to get them as tight as possible i'd say in that 20 to 30 foot range and then the between row spacing probably not any less than that but it could be much more than that great okay um i know we want to start to wrap up here um but uh, i just wanted to remind everyone that that mark is going to be teaching in our permaculture design course which is starting in exactly a week which is incredible. Um, we're so excited over here at Verge. We're we're building up uh, for the next week and uh, and getting everything ready. But we're excited to have you all in the course. Um, if you haven't uh, registered already and you're interested in taking a PDC, head over to vergepermaculture.ca/slash online underscore PDC and um, check out any information that you might be interested in. Or if you guys have any questions, you can also just send me an email directly. I am the PDC course coordinator. So you can email me at jen, J-E-N, at vergepermaculture.ca. And I'd be happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. And not only is Mark teaching in our PDC this year, but he's also going to be a design mentor. So he's going to be there during um, selected office hours throughout these next couple of months, answering your questions, looking at your projects with you, um, marking your project potentially. Um, so he is an incredible uh, resource and a great value to us at Verge in uh, providing incredible knowledge on agroforestry, coppicing, and key lime. Um, 
Oh, we just before we wrap up here, we've got Mitch in in the chat here. He's got a question. Uh, just the last question for you. Um, I'm I'm gonna butcher this because I haven't heard of this, Mitch. But Mitch is asking, have you heard of Daisugi or tried to experiment with Daisugi? I'm, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, I am not certain either. I don't know if that's the conifer sprouts. Um, let me look it up real quick and see what comes up. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's like growing um, stems on, it's D-I-A-S-U-G-I. -D D-I-A-S-U-G-I. Yeah, it's a Japanese technique similar to coppicing used it, the platform cedar. So yes, I, I've seen some incredible photos of it. And um, I did not do much research on it and working on the book on coppicing, but it looks pretty fat. Like these trees look magical because they're kind of these almost like pedestals with branches reaching outwards and then like dead straight shoots um, radiating upwards. And uh, I am fascinated by it. I should know more about it, but um, it looks incredible. I didn't believe that the first few pictures I saw were real because they looked like they were from some like fantasy uh, comic book or something like that or a video game. So Daisugi looks very cool. I know very little about it. And I don't know that there's a ton of good info on it, uh, at least in English. I'm sure there's more in Japanese, but yeah, I'll try to learn more for the class <laughs> at least so I can have like a slide in there because that would be a good thing to include. Yeah, that's neat. I'm going to have to watch some videos on that. Mitch, you'll have to let us know um, what videos we should watch on Daisugi. It sounds sounds pretty neat. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't found any videos, just, just some cool photos. Like, that's cool. I wonder if Mark knows. <laughs> I, right. I came across it and I was like, I got to get this book done. So I can't learn anything new that's not in the book yet. But um, for the class, I'm happy. I'll, I'll try to make sure I've got a, a, at least one slide in it that gives some basics. Cool. Yeah. Good. Okay, Mark. Well, we are going to sign off with you and um, we'll see you in early December for your session with us on agroforestry and key line in the PDC. Perfect. I'm sure it's going to be an awesome class. Um, I can't speak highly enough of it for folks that are thinking of taking it and you are in great hands. So great work, Verge team. And um, I look forward to seeing you all soon.